breakfast puppies? This podcast contains adult language and content and is meant for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. We're all set to begin, so let's dive right in to Bikers, Dice, and Bars. Talking bicycles and motorbikes, gamer things and all the like. You can listen to it in your cars, but mostly it's about... Dyson hey everyone, this is NPC. Due to a major amount of time crunch, this next tiny batch of episodes was edited in more of a rush than our usual process. I really wanted to get the entire 2020 backlog cleared out so I could start 2021 with a clean desk, but I didn't have a lot of time to do it. As such, our usual commitment to a higher standard is not quite as heavy here, and I apologize if the sound quality is just a bit off. This quick edit batch ends with the final episode of our Mothership actual play series. So if you want to skip ahead, we totally understand, but we did have a lot of fun doing it. So we hope you give it a listen. Anyway, on to the actual episode. Hey, Xander, what are we drinking tonight? I have decided it would be a fun and good idea to go and do a bit of a gin tasting here on the air with my best friends. Oh, uh, um, we got we we got more people coming. Uh, no, you you're, you're it. No, this is it. Um, so maneuver the push to talk well with an elbow, <laughs> so I can pour a little bit of gin and get the sound in there for all the kids at home. This is some this is some uh some gymnastics going on here. Well, most of my life these days are mental gymnastics. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we are to kind of start off with the. British classic of Beef Eater out of London, the world's most awarded gin. <laughs> Apparently, NPC does not approve. I am I. I am not a gin drinker. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I can drink gin in the things, but not straight. But no oh, oh, God, I don't want to don't want to lose this. Though. So if you're going to mix something, we'll just you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just pour something in here that I can stir, stir, and we'll, we'll yeah, yeah, good. yeah. For the listeners, he basically just had like the reaction of if you put a piece of tape on a cat's head, <laughs> just kind of like that back up and shake and like kind of anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right. So the back of the bottle says London has always been a remarkable place. It's a city where nothing is impossible. It's a place. (laughs) So good watching people's reactions. Uh, Where the world's best cultural ingredients come together and are distilled into something new. Beef Eater is and always and has always been an authentic product of London made in the same time honored way with great skill and the finest hand selected botanicals. There are reasons why we are the most awarded gin. Speaking of fine botanicals, you're listening to <laughs> Bikers, Dice, and Bars, recorded here in Portland, Oregon. As usual, I'm NPC. I'm just Jacob. Uh, the good doctor, Xander Gerrymander. I am Poppy Beaujolais. Am I the only one that actually drinks gin straight and enjoys no. it? No. Uh, no, it just depends on the kind of gin. I've, had, I've only had a, a couple of gins that uh, I would deem as could drink over ice. And I'm wondering if you maybe brought one today. Well, I did bring four different types of gin that are going to be pretty unique in their own right. So, Is one of them Seven Gables? Nope. Oh, interesting. So yeah. I decided to do a fun thing in which um, I brought some Old World and some New World gin. So we have several selections from Europe. And we have several selections here from the Great Pacific Northwest where a gin revival is currently happening. What is gin? It's what's in my belly right now. Um, so gin, uh, by all accounts, was a Dutch invention um, from the 1600s. And like a lot of alcohol, uh, was uh, created as uh, for medicinal purposes, which is why I can keep saying that and not technically be incorrect. Um, it was initially kind of just basically stilled, uh, distilled uh, spirits that was mixed with uh, juniper oil which is why it's always kind of had a very distinctive piney taste to it. And apparently shortly thereafter, a lot of people in the Netherlands said that they were sick because it tasted so good. (laughs) 
doctors can allow because you can only get to like a pharmacy, I think, back in the day. And all of a sudden, a lot more house calls to people's houses got made out when they first had like, oh, this is the best medicine I've ever had in my life. Generally gone and distilled from grains, much like um, much like vodka is, and then infused with uh, different types of botanicals. Almost always the chief among them is your juniper berry. Um, that is one of the things that makes a gin mo- more distinct than anything else. There are different types of gin. Um, Gen of I believe, is what it was called initially in Holland. Um, and then the uh, British kind of got a taste for it when they were uh, fighting alongside the Dutch. Noticed that all them soldiers were a little bit extra brave and happened to have a little satchel satchel or something, something on their hips. Uh, so the British got a good taste for it and um, and ended up going and starting up their own stills in uh, in uh, in England to go make this stuff too, which is where I kind of came to the to the British to go and discover a fine taste for it. Poppy, did you? I'm sorry. Did you say what kind of grains it's generally f- distilled from, or is it just kind of whatever they happen to have? Whatever they happen to have. One of the ones I brought is actually made with uh, barley and rye. Um, mm. Not quite as common. Wheat's usually more common than most anything else. I would like to add a quick note, listeners. We this is our second excursion into gin. We did a bit of talking about gin, but more specifically gin and tonics last year when we had Larry on Mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Larry's Pig Sauce and uh, the Late Bottles. Uh, It's a good episode. Go back and listen to it if you want to get some more information on gin and tonics and uh, listen to a cool guy talk. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So what we're going to be doing here today, just to go and give you a little bit of a preview of what we're going to be doing with gin, is watching Poppy make funny faces. (laughs) And... (laughs) Then we're going to go and make some cocktails out of this as well. So, so this is interesting because I did not know this history of gin whatsoever. I honestly thought that gin came from, and this just shows my like ignorance as an American. I thought gin was invented by Americans. I, I honestly thought it came out of prohibition because there was always the joke about bathtub gin. And you might get to this <laughs> later, I'm assuming. But yeah, I, I will actually. I honestly thought that that is what what gin <laughs> was, was you just pour grain alcohol into your tub, right? You water it down and you add some juniper berries to make it bearable. And now you have booze. Uh, fun fact, one of the reasons that uh, England did not go through any sort of moral panic around alcohol when the U.S. was doing it, was actually because England had actually been through a prohibition much, much earlier because of gin. Uh, Gin was considered considered at one point the scourge of the underclass, and they ended up uh, enacting a short-lived prohibition against hard spirits because of it. Yeah, it was uh, in the, you know, peasant-filled streets of merry old England back in the day, I believe it was referred to as the opium of the poor because they were just drowning in that stuff. Yeah, that's, that's where the, the term uh, gin blossoms came from. It's not just a 90s band. It's that thing that happens to your skin when you drink too much. There was the English comparison between beer row, which beer was still considered a positive drink of Honest working men and even the upper classes and then Gin Alley where you had drunkards and destitutes. This was roughly running up. To, I can't remember exactly when the period was, but it was just before the Jack and or Jack the Ripper period. So, oh, yeah, interesting. it was like mid 1800s. Yeah, it gave rise to the whole Whit- Whitchapel area oh. and all of that. I didn't know Gin was that old. I learned something today. Yeah, I mean, it's been around for about 400 plus years at this point. Oh, and uh, so a couple other fun things about Gin, which I, again, very much enjoy. Um, there's also uh, the other most popular type of Gin is called Old Tom Gin. And as the name suggests, it is Gin that has been aged in barrels. Oh, oh I thought you were about to say it was been aged in a man named Tom. Yep, they just pickle them up. Oh, man. <laughs> no, oh, They've been who, passing Tom down for who generations. Who do you think is in the barrel? <laughs> uh, so it actually has an interesting kind of like yellowish hue to it. And, of course, uh, all things that have been aged in barrels, it does pick up the notes um, of the wood and whatnot. It is generally not aged for a particularly long period of time, um, just enough to give a little bit of kind of a more kind of robust flavor. Um, and the NPC is refusing our next gen. So. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not drinking anymore until I get a mix. <laughs> But this is, yeah, no. Mm -mm. I'll drink for both of us. 
Okay, so what is our next gen, Xander? Our next gen comes from Forest Grove. Yep. Oh. Uh, distilled and bottled by Dogwood Distilling mm-hmm. out of Forest Grove, Oregon here. Uh, double distilled. And for those at home, generally speaking, the, uh, if you want a smoother type of spirit, you will distill it over and over and over again. What that does is it removes the impurities from the liquor itself. I would also argue it removes the character. Which is why when you see things like, you know, 10 times distilled vodka, it is very smooth and tastes like nothing. As vodka should. As vodka should. Now, double distilled means this is still going to have some character in it from the initial grains that it was distilled from. And, uh, you know, it's going to be real nice. Real nice. Uh, Established in 2010, handcraft in small batches is all this very limited bottle tells me about it. Ooh. But it is locally made. It is a very reasonable price. And so if you want to go and shop local and support your local distillers, Union Gin is a fine one to go and obtain. Yeah, I I, I can definitely see just doing a nice gin and tonic on a summer day with this. Mm-hmm. Just some very fizzy water up in my nose and some of this splashed in there. That's that's very nice. So this one is definitely a lot more botanical forward um, than the beef eater, which kind of just smacks you right in the face with juniper and doesn't let you go. Which, again, I like drinking pine trees, but not everybody does. And I felt the beef nope. e- the beef eater was very much alcohol forward. Yep, it was very much like here's some booze, smash. <laughs> and that's a characteristic of dry gins, if I'm correct. They tend to be a little bit more alcohol juniper forward, not yeah. as many other aromatics. Yeah. Hence the like London dry style. Mm. Um, yeah, the, the the two main different types of of gin, as uh, just Jacob is referring to, are again the London dry style or also American dry style, and there's also ones that would definitely be considered to be much more botanical forward. Now that we're talking about it and that I'm thinking about it, this reminds me of Malort, but less bitter. It feels like, uh, look, they're both very botanical forward whatevers, (laughs) beverages, spirits. There we go. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Malort, now that I was thinking, uh, I remember during our episode, I think we described it as being like an uh, a gin that went wrong. <laughs> That made some bad life choices. Gin that made some bad dark, life choices. Dark right. path. I was yeah. looking at you like you were insane because I'm like, this is nothing like my Lord. Yeah. <laughs> I was also looking at him like he was insane because this is nothing like my Lord. But I can I don't I think kind this of is see... like my Lord. I would say that my Lord is more like this in that it's got a lot of the heavy botanicals that hit you. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe they left Tom in the bin for too long. <laughs> <laughs> they made Malort. <laughs> Mr. Tom Malort. <laughs> the, the flavor profile of Malort that I described as pencil shavings yeah. is definitely what is echoed to a certain extent, especially in dry gins. Yes, this particular gin is made with 11 botanicals, which is kind of about the average for a lot of different types of gin. Um, I also bought some other gins that have a lot more. Um, and I also got one... Yeah, these are also all uh, 88% alcohol. Uh, sorry, 88 proof. <laughs> 88% what alcohol would kill us. <laughs> these are all 88 proof. For uh, the record, 88% isopropyl. alcohol will not kill you. <laughs> As someone who has drank more than a little white uh, white flash in his time. I was just going with it. I'm like, oh, 80%. Okay, cool. <laughs> I feel like you'd be flopping on the floor if I gave you something that was 80% alcohol or 160 proof. Yeah, yeah. You're like, I don't know. A little white lightning to get your day rolling. Oh, God. Yeah, so I also went, and later on tonight, we're going to be making some Negronis. And to make the Negronis, I have bought, speaking of things that are actually really bitter, it literally says bitter on the bottle. Bitter, like really big. Yeah, is uh, a, I think this is a 1960s bottle of Campari. It looks really old. Yeah, yeah, it is. It yeah. looks, yeah, it's, see, that, that, that bottle of Campari has seen some shit, I think. Ooh, this one's interesting. I have not, I also have not had the Ransom Dry Gin straight before. So. Yeah, this. What the actual fuck? <laughs> what, Campari? No, the this, the gin. So this is... <laughs> Sorry, gin, if you're listening. <laughs> we just lost gin. <laughs> we just lost no, 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 no. I'm going to make it up for the both of you. <laughs> this is J. Henry Ransom Highly Malted Dry Gin out of Sheridan, Oregon. Me. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Drawing inspiration from Holland's renowned malt wine, Genevieve's, this is a pot of distilled malty gin with intense botanical influences, the finest ingredients, meticulous attention to ferments, and obsessive distillation techniques combined to bring you to this unique American gin. Excellent, uh, excellent for cocktails such as the Collins, improved Holland gin, the Koopstok, or just for sipping, Random Spirits is an artisanal farm distillery dedicated to producing ultra-premium spirits. All bottlings are unaltered products of distillation, no artificial flavors, no artificial, no, no additives, flavorings, or sweeteners have been used. Please enjoy in moderation. <laughs> I, okay, I want to I want to get my reaction. I didn't drink it until Xander was done because I need to get my reaction on. It smells horrible. I'm so sorry, whoever makes this, this beautiful, beautiful gin. It smells super malty. It smells disgusting. Okay. Oh, I was reading some of the botanicals earlier, and one of them was is hops, and this smells like a brewery. Is what it, this smells like. It does have like the after smell after you've boiled a wort to it. I'm wondering if that's from the hops. Wort. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. So this is barley, rye, corn, juniper, lemon, coriander, angelico root. Not sure what that is. It, it's it's for cats, jellical cats. Okay. Maybe it is wart. Caraway. What, that anise? was the name in uh, cats. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Cats. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. that just went right over my fucking yeah, head. Give me a second. I, was like, Wait, I, I have actually read Old Possum's book of Practical Cats. <laughs> uh, anise, Marion berries. It's interesting. Orris root, hops. There it is. Uh, cardamom and orange. So this is a very drastically, drastically different gin. Um, better for cocktails, I would say, than sipping. It almost feels like they built a gin designed to be to survive mixers is I, I, yeah. they talk about drinking it straight. This is not one that I'd be super no. excited to drink straight. I thought you were about to say survive the bomb fall. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, there's this... a lot of pine trees up here. I mean, Xander and I in the aftermath can set up a distillery pretty easy. Oh, we sure could. Yeah. This one's not my favorite for sipping straight. I can definitely see it being good as they suggest in a Collins. I think that would be nice. Um, I can even see it coming through pretty strong with a with a very uh, high quality gin and tonic or uh, with a tonic as well. Mm-hmm. Um, for the cocktails I want to make later tonight, I'm not going to do it. Nope, because they're not going to complement uh, what's going on here. This, dear listeners, if you want to know what this gin tastes like, it tastes like cold McDonald's fries that have been in your car for a day. Yeah, I mean, again, it's. It's it's very it's very malty. It's very hoppy. Um, I almost want to experiment with it a little bit in a beer cocktail, maybe. Ooh, interesting. Like, yeah, like I, I'm seeing like a good Mexican lager in this, and maybe some egg white. We will talk after the show. That sounds like something we can we can go and uh, yeah 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 go and uh, uh, figure out real quick. But yeah, I mean, c- just because it, it literally smells like a brewery. It smells like <laughs> it's wild. Okay, I'm sorry. Point of order, because I may have just said something incredibly stupid. Is it wart or wort? So I have heard it pronounced both ways. Okay. Uh, most of the brewers I hang out with call it wart, but I have no idea if that's the correct pronunciation. Okay. What is this thing that you are talking about? It grows on your thumb sometimes. No, oh. that's a wart. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Fucking English slash German. <laughs> English is not a language. It's a mugger in an alley that rolls other languages and takes out useful participles. <laughs> For once, I broke the group rather than the group breaking me. Oh, God. Oh, fuck you, English accents. That's funny. So the question stands, what is it that you're talking about? Um, a wart is your initial boil of, d- depending on your process, um, but for beer and um, distilled spirits, you usually start by boiling a wart, which is you add good clean water to your pot, you boil it to start the extraction process of flavors and such, 
Um, you can add other things at that point, um, depending on your distillation style. You may think, add things at that point. You may add it after the boil. You may add it after distillation. Um, but generally speaking, to make a distilled spirit, you make a very crappy wort for making beer, but an excellent wort for, wort for distilling. Um, a wort for beer usually is nearly drinkable after the boil. So basically, it's boiled uh whatever your grains are that you're distilling your spirit out of, whether it's, you know, barley, rye, corn. And it's, it's kind of like a consistency of oatmeal. Yeah. And it's um, apparently super sweet. Yep. Because um, you got all the little yeasties in there going to town and making sugars for you. Mm-hmm. And then comes the mash. <clears throat> yep. And then comes the... Sorry, okay, anyway. <laughs> we are now drinking Citadel wine because I wanted to go back across the pond for a little bit. This is from France. Um, it looks like it was started in 1996. This almost has no smell that I can really pick up on. It's very light in the smell. Super light. Um, this is the most botanical one that we're going to try today. It's the last one we're going to try today before we actually start making cocktails out of these things. Um, yeah, 19 botanicals. Elegant, soft, and smooth with voluptuous. Good choice. Of you, or, or, you know, good choice. Complexity and a refined finish. The crisp flavors of fresh juniper berries enhanced with 18 other carefully selected botanicals, each infused just long enough to bring out their own quote unquote personality. This is from 2008. Citadel Gin. I love how the English bottle is like, <laughs> we're square. We get the job done. Fuck you. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you can also use it to beat someone to death in a pub. Uh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> Whereas the French bottle is like, you could also put some lovely perfumes in this when you're done. Oh, this is, would make a great vase. No, it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> um, botanicals are juniper, iris, almond, which is interesting, fennel, star anise, lemon peel, orange peel, cardamom, violet, which is a good choice, I think. We'll have to get a, a creme de violette cocktail the, on here sometime. Yeah, I'll talk dirty to you all day long. Uh, coriander. Kubeb. Not sure what that is. C-U-B-E-B. Oh, sure. interesting. Something Jacob doesn't know. That might be a first. Uh, there's been many times. Uh, cassis. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, cassia. Not so much what that is. Licorice. Savory. Nutmeg. Angelica. Cumin. 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 Uh, wow. Cumin. And Cinnamon. Which are incredibly unusual to put in gin. Yeah, it sounds like this gin came out of the French period in India when yeah. <laughs> India was vying for England for domination. And uh, Grains of Paradise. So that's what we have here with Citadel. I am relatively certain that I have some creme de violetta upstairs. This is a super botanical forward. Mm -hmm. There are so many interesting flavors on my tongue right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I... Having read it out loud, I actually am taking a little bit of tingle of cumin at the end of the tongue, which is unusual. This is a gin I would probably go, and probably not want to mix with anything. There's yeah. too much complexity going on with this gin to have me want to go and fuck it up with anything else. This is a gin on the rocks on a nice summer day kind of sipping gin. Yeah, at maybe a splash of soda just to open yeah. it up a little. Yeah, but I think once you have the rocks in there, that water will kind of mm -hmm. go and open it up a little bit too. Maybe a splash of soda, but I honestly would not mix this with anything. This is a complex, delicious, multi-layered, multi-faceted gin. And probably, again, just on its own, I think the best thing I've tried tonight. Uh, this, I yeah. think, is the best so far. It it tastes, this is interesting in that it tastes better than it smells. Right. Because when I first, and I don't know if it was just the last one was just still haunting my <laughs> glass or something, but I, I feel like this one, like I was expecting it to be more cold McDonald's French fries and it is actually, this is lovely. Yeah. It's like drinking a, uh, it's like, drinking like, like, like a, like a, like a, uh, like a botanist shop or something. Yeah. 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 Where somehow cumin got, well, like, cumin just blows my mind. Yeah. I've like. The cumin? French using cumin in gin? <laughs> yeah, it's it's that's where I go. It's like, did did you all remember when you were a colonial power suddenly or something? <laughs> <laughs> oh right, we have all these spices in storage. <laughs> Where'd you get them all? Our colonial holdings. <laughs> yeah, this I mm, yeah. I could sip this on rocks all day long. Yep, 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 yep. Uh thank you for finding this, Jacob. You're welcome. It was, it, it was. You quite gotta tell a, the story. You oh, gotta tell man. the story. It's so good. 
So Xander, I, I, Xander handed me off what amounts to half of the shopping list to find, um, and he gave me Beef Eater, which, you know, you, you walk into any liquor store and Beef Eater's available. Usually there's four plus facings and you can buy it by a plastic handle, you know. Um, Arguably the most distributed or at least well-known gin in the world, I would say. It's up at least in the top three. I mean, yeah, it's it's fighting Tanqueray and Bombay uh, for... And if, you're, and if you're still in Gin Alley, maybe Gordon's. Yeah, and maybe. <laughs> well, I mean, Gordon's might be the most uh, common. <laughs> yeah, all right. Good, good boy. But anyways, uh, so I went into, I, I had to do a little bit of searching because we live in Oregon and the OLCC is just a bag of dicks. And I managed to find a liquor store that had it. I even called ahead because like most places said they only had two to three bottles. Uh, And so I went in, grabbed the Citadel. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce Citadel in French. It's spelled the French spelling. So God help my accent there. Um, But and I found that it was right of it immediately available. And I went to grab the beef eater, which is available everywhere. I could not find the beef eater. I had to ask a store employee to show me where the two facings, one for the small size I brought and one for the regular size, were. And it was hidden in the rum section for two facings they borrowed from the rum section next to the gin section. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, that's weird. That's just weird. Though I do think if we ever do a gin tasting again, what we're going to have to do is go and check out some Navy Strength gin. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm curious. I've noticed there is a gin missing from this table. It's one of the only gins that I'm actually personally used to, which is aviation. Oh, yes. The great Oregon classic. Yeah. Yeah, I... When I went to the liquor store today on my way over here, uh, they actually are cool. They have an entire section right at the cash register that features Oregon gin or, uh, or, or Pacific Northwest gin. And I looked at all these and I was like, okay, I've had Union before. I know it's solid. I used to serve Ransom Old Tom Gin, which I actually quite enjoyed. Um, so I'll try the regular one. But they did have stuff like Aria, which is also another um, Oregon Gin. Uh, Aviation, obviously, I believe was purchased by Ryan Reynolds. I, I think so. I yeah. think so. Um, which goes again to show that Ryan, Ryan Reynolds has some good taste. He really does have some good taste. I've been rewatching Deadpool lately and I've been very happy about that. Um so I've tried those before <laughs> um, and I want to get some outside of the Portland metro area as well, just to kind of go and give shout outs to our even smaller uh, local small town distillers, which is why I went with um, with uh, Union and Ransom. But Aviation is a fucking solid, solid gin that everyone should check out if you have not had it yet. It's so good. Ryan, Ryan Reynolds wanted all of it. So I and I know that once uh, COVID restrictions list here, listen to me date this episode, um, that the crew that makes Union Gin out in Forest Grove does do tours. And while I have never been on the tour, I've actually had the pleasure of drinking with a member of their production crew. And uh, my, my in what he said and my sense of it is that that crew is a bunch of hardcore geeks, uh, especially about liquor and distilling. And so I we mean we may need to take a field trip and, um, you know, abuse Nathaniel's taste buds again. And <laughs> oh, God. Take the, re- the portable recording studio. Uh, Nathaniel, there's also a real, real good small capacity uh brewery out there so we can do a two-in-one and make it worth your while fair enough speaking of gin poppy just got me an amazing wallet from ramblin leather goods uh you can go and read that or i uh, watch that uh, yeah we can go and uh re-listen to that episode which was quite good with mr brown and his amazing leather skills and as i was going through my shitty old wallet to the bad motherfucker Hell yeah. Wallet that Poppy got me for Christmas. I found the card for Aria Portland Gin when I was trying to convince them to go and sell their product at my work. Oh, so, awesome. Aria is also a really good gin. Again, 
I only didn't get you, Aria. No disrespect to you. It's because I wanted to get some non Nencho gins. But isn't Sake One out there too? Sake One is out that direction. I don't remember what municipality Sake One lands in. Okay. But like Sake One is a massive facility. Mm-hmm. Like just a massive facility. You, From my understanding, the crew at, at uh, Dogwood Distilling is a much smaller operation. Cool. Uh, more in line with uh, what you see size-wise for, like, what aviation has inside of mm-hmm. Portland, what some of the other smaller operations do. I mean, it's it's definitely larger than the house you live in unless you're rolling in dough. But it's, like, if you go to the Sake One distillery, it's a complex. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, now that we've had... Sorry, now that most of us have tried. <laughs> we need to save NPC here. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now that most of us have tried all these gins, um, I'm going to go and pour us the classic gin and tonic. So which gin would you like in your G&T, Poppy, and why? I, you know, I will go with that last one. Um, the Citadel? The Citadel, yeah. It had, I think it has the most flavor um, and, but it is also, it has a flavor I enjoy. <laughs> I liked it the best. That's all I'm going to, yeah. So while you're constructing that gin and tonic, um, Poppy, you did mention that you are a fan of certain gins straight. Um, which ones do you like straight? The, I haven't had a lot of straight gins, but when I took the distillery tour at McMenamin's, um, oh God, where was that? Was that at the, um... God, what's it called? If you were taking a distillery tour, there are exactly two distilleries in the company. There is either the Cornelius Pass Roadhouse out in Hillsboro, or there's the one at Edgefield where I work at out in Troutdale. It was Cornelius Pass. Yep. I, I did a, I did a distillery tour, and the brewer was with the distiller was was there, and we got to taste all of their mini gins. And I think one of them was Seven Gables. They make two, I think. Yeah, no, we make the Joe Pennies and we make just, it's just called Gables. Gables. And Gables is the much more botanical forward gin that we make. And they make that at Cornelius Pass Roadhouse. Yes. The Joe Pennies is an American dry style uh, gin that we make at Edgefield. And okay. they're, and again, I almost <laughs> brought a bottle of Joe Pennies, but. Yeah, I think it was Gables. And that was, I think, one of the first gins I've ever had that I was like, I could drink this just straight. It's delicious. The irony is I don't like it. <laughs> Interesting. And I I'm, I think it was Gables. It may have been Joe Penny. No. But... The, yeah. Yeah. Again, Gables, they make it um, at, at, was at Cornelius at, at CPR. Yeah. Um, and there's just some of the flavors that they have in the botanicals. I just don't really care for. But here's the thing. I recognize it as a very, very excellent. Sure. Botanical forward gin. Just not to my taste. Yeah. Fair. yeah. You know, and, and like I'm going to do a little bit of a hot take here. The reality is, is that I cannot stand the big two, uh, Bombay and Tanqueray. Uh, and it's because they, I don't know for sure. I, I, if you go on YouTube and look at like reviews of it and com- comments on it, there's a sneaking suspicion on the part of a lot of people that they post distilling add a little bit of corn syrup to the final product mm. to sweeten it up. Because if you ever drink Tanqueray or Bombay, it's a much sweeter gin. And when you distill a gin, it's really hard to get residual sugar. And so I, I and, and I don't like them because they're too sweet. Mm. It also, I mean, I don't know of any gins that are distilled from corn. But generally speaking, when you distill things from corn and your and your mash build is much more corn heavy, those things tend to be sweeter. Um, so your 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 more uh, corn heavy uh, whiskeys, for example, are going to have a kind of sweeter taste to us. I wonder if that might also be the the thing because they're not dis- disclosing what I think they're making there. Right, and and they from. they also, you know, fun fact: sometimes Xander and I will uh, get into a heated conversation not against each other mind you but just in general to the regarding the entire uh, fact that there are a lot of uh, companies that make distilled spirits out there that don't make their own distilled spirits 
Look at you, bullet bourbon. Oh, yeah. And well, do, do they not make their own? No. I didn't they, know that. They, don't. No. They, bu- they buy their stock from a third party st- st- supplier out and of do, Indiana and do aging and finishing. Um, <clears throat> and so they, they take the raw post distilled mash or stock and finish it. And that's how they do it. Fascinating. So a fun thing, too, if you're looking at a bottle, any bottle of any spirit, you know, sometimes it'll say just, you know, made by blah, 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 blah. What you want to look for is distilled and bottled by yep. that company, because mm. that says that they actually have an actual distillery, unlike Bullet Bourbon, which does not have an actual distillery. Yep. Yep. For yep. instance, that, I'm not picking on them. That was just the first thing that came to mind because they're the most popular one we'll probably know about. So always make sure you look for distilled and depending on the spirit, aged and bottled by. Yep. That's the uh, ultimate assurance that this company did every process from the initial to the aging, if necessary, to the actual bottling. So they've done everything. That's what you want to look for. Okay. For my gin and tonic, I am actually going to try the Ransom because I have never had that Ransom dry in a gin and tonic before. That's actually a pretty good call. I almost went that way, but I wanted to go classic beef feeder for myself. But um, I, if I have another one, I might go with the Ransom just because I feel like it's going to be better in a cocktail than it is by itself because it's not. I, I just want to see. I just want to see. NPC. You want, a, he, you want a Hennessy? Oh, I'll have a Hennessy. <laughs> <laughs> NPC, what would you like? I have no preferences, so surprise me. So he wants a, a short order beef eater, you know, the one where you only splash a touch of the tonic in hmm. while building the gin. <laughs> you just spill a little in the glass. <laughs> I have been cooked out of the house. <laughs> Woof, that was a look. <laughs> All right, let's get just shake up here, going with the ransom gin. Yes, yes. Which. You know, if it wasn't COVID, I'd try to sip out of his glass, so I'll have to try a little bit later. Single cube, please. Also, their lid is really weird. It's not a cork. It's not a screw-off. It's like hard plastic. Yeah. yeah is yeah, it yeah. glass? No, it's plastic. It's plastic. Oh. Yeah, when I first pulled this off, I thought I was breaking the bottle. I got a little nervous there for a yeah, second. Yeah, <laughs> no, when I, when I unwrapped it for you and popped the top to pour Poppy her sample, it was like, did, did something just break? Do we need to cancel this one? <laughs> yeah. Oh my! It just it just opened up this ransom bottle. I just smells like I'm in a brewery all over again. It's yep. this is so. This is by far the most fragrant of the gins. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll cap this shit before it stinks up the whole room. I did not care for it. <laughs> what are we using for tonic tonight, Xander? We are using. Because I love and care about you guys. We are using Fever Tree Premium Indian Tonic. Mm. There are no artificial sweeteners in this. It is says natural quinine. And I'll tell you a fun story about that shit in just a second. Um, so a lot of tonic waters have just too much shit in it. Mm-hmm. This is just carbonated spring water, sugar, citric acid, natural flavorings, uh, flavorings including quinine. Mm, quinine. Quinine. Because, you know, it is winter and scurvy is a possibility. Right. But it's also the Pacific Northwest, so probably not malaria. Probably not malaria. More on that in just a second once I get NBC's cocktail. Here you go. So I, part of the reason I embraced the gin idea for this session was because I'm actually... You wanted to see the looks on Poppy and NBC's faces when they tried them? You know, I got all that out of my system for the moment with the Mad Dog. And I do say for the moment. Because my job is to terrorize this group with alcohol. Um, and I, But I'm actually a big fan of winter gin drinks. Um, whether it be a gin and tonic or a Negroni. Gin is often thought of as a summer cocktail. And I, I kind of wanted to explore opening people's eyes to gin is okay to drink during the dark months. What am I drinking here, Xander? I gave you the union gins that would make it so that each one of us is drinking a different type of gin in our gin and tonic. This isn't the worst thing ever. (laughs) 
Um, so gin and tonic, the history is actually quite fascinating. Um, during the speaking of more history of gin, during the uh, conquest of India by the we'll call them Lamies, um <laughs> by the British, uh, obviously these folks were not used to the scourge that is malaria because they're you know obviously England's not very tropical. But, you know, when you send your colonial imperialist armies all across the globe, you encounter different types of people and different types of diseases. Malaria being chief amongst them in a much more tropical area such as India. So quinine, which is a uh, derived from bark, uh, actually wards off malaria. Yep. And so they, the British started to make it into a very bitter tonic drink. And no one much cared to just drink it by itself. However... Ever since the, you know, late 16, early 1700s, British sailors, marines, and sail, uh, soldiers were given rations of gin. Yep. So quite naturally, with their need for also to get vitamin C in their system, they figured, you know, this tonic water goes down a lot easier if you throw some fucking gin in there. Mm-hmm. Mm. A little squeeze of lime and you'll have it just right. So the gin and tonic, much like the India Pale Ale or IPA, was born out of the imperial conquest of India by the British. So great drinks, bad history. Yep, yep, yep. Interesting fact as to why limes are the thing with gin and tonic, unless you are drinking one of the odd ones, like one of my favorites. Um, oh, uh, cucumber gin. Um, Hennessy. Hennessy, uh, which is um, Hendrix. It's Hendrix. Sorry, Hendrix is you're the right. sweet liquor. Hennessy, Hennessy is We the, said Hennessy earlier because so I was trying yep. to make a joke, but I was... Yep. That's a fucking... Cognac. That's a fucking cognac. Yeah, Hendrix. Um, Hendrix, which is uh, made with cucumbers, tastes like cumber, cucumbers, and served with a slice of cucumber. It literally says, do not serve lime with this. Serve it with a slice of cucumber. And it actually, to be honest, they're not lying. It kind of sucks. The reason why <laughs> limes go with gin and tonics is that in many areas of the former British Empire, lime trees were easier to grow, and be- limes actually store better on seagoing vessels than lemons do. Uh, they be- Interesting. Didn't be- know that. Because of their higher acid count and so smaller overall dimensions, um, they dry up but still have, uh, but don't mold as much as lemons do. Um, that is true. I mean, if you ever have cut into a, you know, dried up, looks like it shriveled as shit fucking lime, you can still squeeze some fucking juice out of that thing. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, if you can, I mean, if you ever want to do this at home, I don't know why you'd want to intentionally leave a lime and a lemon out on the counter. The lemon will mold. The lime will merely turn brown and shrivel uh, under most circumstances. And while it's still brown and shriveling, um, it's still actually usable uh, for flavoring. And, and, and I have a couple... Has some juice. I have a it's couple weird. Indian recipes that call for pre-shriveling your limes. I would be interested in hearing about those later. Um, so to go back to some more gin history, as Poppy was alluding to earlier, bathtub gin, which, A, is a great fucking... Speakeasy bar in Seattle, if you were ever up there, go to Bathtub Gin. It's hard to find. It's literally it's literally down an alley, and I couldn't there was no sign out front. And this homeless guy literally was stumbling out. Are you looking for the bar, man? It's down the alley, like in that door, it's unmarked. Thanks, dude. <laughs> Here's a dollar. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but bathtub gin, as Poppy was alluding to, was a thing that was made during Prohibition when the thing th- that would sell the quickest, easiest, fastest without being of any kind of great quality, but also wouldn't, you know, murder your taste buds, was to distill a fuck ton of spirits and then just throw some fucking juniper berries in there and call it a day. And oftentimes done in a bathtub because everyone had one of those in their house. And they would just scoop that shit up and bottle it and drink it, um, water it down to an appropriate degree. And it wasn't supposed to be great, but it was better than the alternative a lot of the times. And, not, you know, obviously better than nothing if you wanted to get your fix. Uh, a funny story about bathtub gin. My grandpa Bolt, when he graduated uh, from Purdue with his Ph.D. in chemistry, stole a bunch of chemicals from the chem lab <laughs> and made bathtub gin for all of his friends. For a, grad- for a graduation party. <laughs> like you do. 
And if you had ever met this man, my grandpa Bull was the waspiest son of a bitch. <laughs> Just stoic as fuck. You know, he had a sense of humor, but it was drier than a London dry. Hmm. And uh, I, I can't imagine him stealing anything. So him being in his 20s, crashing the fucking cam lab to go and make bathtub gin for everybody just tickles me to no end. This is quite refreshing. I would not think of I would not think of this as a wintertime drink, but I kind of I kind of I kind of get it with the the sort of the botanicals. It's kind of cozy, you know, even though it's it's a chilled drink, it still has that kind of warm and fuzzy, you know, and then like scent of pine, you know, you know, reverts one to Christmas time and stuff like that. Like, well, I kinda, you kind of get it. Yeah. You also chose the one that had the 19 botanicals as opposed to like the 11 or the eight in the other one. So you chose yeah. the most like complex. Here's a little bit of everything being thrown at you. Citadel gin. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. that's probably why you're getting that. But um, also, I mean, again, I feel like a G&T is it's nice because it's universal. And it's nice because you can get them anywhere and everywhere. However, the vast majority of bars you will go to will have shitty tonic. Shit. There's even a reference in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy <laughs> about the gin and tonic being the most universally, interdimensionally known beverage. Every culture has one, and it's usually something like the gin and tonics or the gin and tonics or, or whatever. Yeah, it's just like yeah. 10 different spellings for it. Yeah. But it's all the same thing. Yeah, no. That's a great reference point, too. And it is, I mean, again, again, when you're the British Empire and you basically had your boots on the ground everywhere, you're going to spread that drink. So let's say you walk into a bar sometime months and years from now when we can do that again. But you walk into a bar and you have a hankering for a gin and tonic. And you don't want the shitty tonic and you don't want the shitty gin. What are our chances of having... What are our, A, what are our chances of having good gin? Assuming it's a, a stocked bar and it's not like, you know, oh, we mostly do beer and we've got like a really old bottle of Jim Bean and buying the bar, you know. Fully stocked bar. Maybe they have some higher shelf stuff. But you're like, I don't want, I don't want the fucking, you know, McCormick's and I don't want it. <laughs> no one wants I, McCormick's. No one wants, I don't want, and I don't want the shitty tonic. Like, what, what do you say? How do you order that drink? I would say that the vast majority of bars, unfortunately, are just going to have shitty tonic. Mm. You have to go to a much uh, higher quality, you know, upper end cocktail bar if you want to get um, Q tonic or Fever Tree or something like that. Uh, I am sure they sell Fever Tree uh, on a soda gun because my work actually uses Fever Tree ginger beer on the soda gun. Hmm. So they must make the tonic somewhere. But yeah, it is generally going to be a hard thing to find anything other than like Schweppes as far as yeah. Schweppes, Canada Dry. Yeah. However, most bars will at least have a decent gin. Generally that decent gin is going to be beef eater. Um, most of them will have Tanqueray or Bombay Dry or Bombay Sapphire. Um, more often than not, Bombay Sapphire over Bombay Dry. And those are all decent choices. Um, I've heard Montepaloa makes a decent gin. I've not had it before. I haven't had it either. I know they make it. I'm sure the price point's good. (laughs) I'm sure Montepaloa. I mean, it's not like Nikolai Vodka is making a gin. (laughs) (laughs) Inside joke for our bartender and Barfly fans out there. Um, Yeah, I mean, I've... I've come across so few bars that are decently stocked. They're not going to have at least like three or four um, decent to good uh, uh, gin uh, selections. And of course, if you're always feeling fancy, there's Hendrix. So um, my workaround on that, because it is a constant problem. I will also say that in addition to high end bars, there's actually hidden gem bars, um, especially in the Pacific North, Northwest, where there are bars that are not exactly high-end bars, but they'll actually have Fever Tree. Um, I'm not going to give away all of my secret favorites, but we've named this one on the air before, and I'll do it again. Go to Patreon if you want these answers. Um, I'll, I'll give this one for free. Uh, Vintage 
in um oh in um uh, uh, I don't remember the neighborhood Montevilla uh, Montevilla thank, thank you, you. Um, oh that place is so good it is so good it is so not a high end bar. But when the first time I walked in there and the special of the day was a Chicago fizz, I was like, you have my attention, sir. (laughs) It's tiny and impossible to get into. But like they have fever tree or other high end tonics. So if you walk into a bar, though, and you need a workaround, the workaround I've developed for getting a decent quality gin and tonic is I see what they have. Um, I look for something like aviation um, or uh, another of the really decent gins, Union, um, Aria. Aria. Uh, there's a couple other bigger name brands out there as well. Dancing Dog. Dancing Dog um, that are decent. And then I ask the bartender for a gin and tonic, but two-thirds the amount of of tonic that they'd normally use and mm-hmm. make up the difference with soda. However, tip your bartender extra because it's a bit of a pain in the ass. I would also say, too, the reason that we're, you know, shit-talking things like Schweppes and Canada Dry is that, you know, the amount of it sugar... High fructose corn high syrup fructose is corn the devil. Syrup, and they plug it full of that to Ugh. make up for other things. Gross. It's cheap. It's easy. They actually skimp on the uh, on the quinine because that's an expensive ingredient to throw into something you're just going to go and squirt out of a soda gun. So that's the reason why if you want a good, good gin and tonic, because again, if you're going to have a cocktail with two fucking ingredients and one of them is garbage, and one of them is great, you're going to have a mediocre cocktail. Follow up question. So let's say I go into a bar and I'm I got a hanker in for gin, but I know they've got the shitty tonic. I don't want to fuck around with that. So, but I want a good gin drink. What are other delicious gin drinks one might order at a at a bar that they could reasonably not look at you and go, "Huh?" Oh. That's a fabulous segue. I love Hooray. that question. Actually, I was actually just about to tell the story. Is that when I, uh, you know, in the pre-COVID times, when I'm doing, <laughs> when I'm doing bartender training, the first thing I teach either servers or bartenders if, when someone goes and asks for a martini. You know, what's the first question you ask them? They're like, uh, the first question you ask them is gin or vodka. And if they say vodka, you roll up a newspaper, you hit them on the nose and you tell them no. Because they fucking All will fight you. Good. We'll do this later. Because <laughs> um, to me, a martini needs to be gin. To me, there's no question about this. Otherwise, what you're ordering because I get ordered like, you know, bone dry vodka martinis all the time. All that is, is a chilled vodka shot in a fucking fancy glass, you piece of shit. Scare it with a little vermouth. <laughs> just just mention the word and it cowers in fear. Um, so the martini is the most classic gin cocktail that you can have, I would argue, which is depending on your ratios, I like a three to one gin to dry vermouth margin. Um, and I actually will throw in like a dash or two of uh, Regan's orange bitters in there. And I will go and I will take my uh, martini with a twist of lemon on top. Whereas I am a, if I'm going to have a gin martini, uh, I have a dry gin martini perfect Gibson. Mm. So that is, uh, yeah, I I know it sounds like a train wreck. Xander's giving me a look like. I am. uh, Because who would blend uh, sweet and dry vermouth um, and just spray the glass with it a little bit to, you know, introduce it as an acquaintance. (laughs) Make them be friends. Uh, give me the dry gin and then drop those two onions in it and what a happy camper. Yeah, see, Papa's giving you the same look because you're a fucking monster. I am a monster. You, I'm the one who brought the mad dog. I mean, like, I yeah, might yeah. as well lean into it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the martini is going to be the most classic thing you can do. What I would recommend if you're going to order this at a bar is know what you like. A typical martini at most bars is going to come with like a uh, a rinse of dry vermouth. They put like maybe like a quarter ounce, they rinse it from the glass, they dump it out, and then they stir your gin and they pour it into your fancy uh, martini glass. And then they will probably go and give you olives. I fucking hate olives. Olives are disgusting. Um, Just put it out there. Yeah. And if... Uh, you know, so martinis can be made many, many different ways. A lot of bars these days are not even really putting even like a, barely a breath of dry vermouth into their martinis these days, which is weird mm-hmm. to me because the traditional cocktail recipe that I was taught was a three to one ratio 
uh, kind of much like a really good Manhattan with, um, yep. you know, bourbon or rye and, and sweet vermouth. And you'll get customers sending it back if you start, make it that way. They, you definitely will. So mm. find, find out how you like it. And then, you know, there's different terms you can use. You know, if you want it wet, that means extra vermouth. You want it dry, that means barely. That, that's the kind of like the, the, the vermouth rinse. Extra dry, it means like you kind of like whew, blew the vermouth bottle over the glass and called it good. <laughs> or if you're in a real, real, real high-end bar, they have an aerosolizer oh, yeah. that just sprays the glass with little, it. A little spritzer. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, of course, you can order it dirty or filthy or... So filthy, you wouldn't take it home to meet your mom. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, I like my vodka martinis filthy. That I can understand because you're not ruining gin at that point. You're just ruining vodka, which is already a ruined spirit. Um, uh, dirty martini just means it's the olive juice. And so the- much fucking olive Ugh, juice. Gross. Yeah. Yeah. Gross. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so those are kind of, that, that's an easy one. What I'll be making for us next, actually, is another classic cocktail that most um, most bars will serve you. And that is going to be the Negroni I'm very uh, excited about the Negroni. Yeah, a Negroni is equal parts uh, dry gin, Campari, and sweet vermouth. You had also asked about some other beverages. I think we also missed the Collins and the Gimlet, which Ooh. are ones that I frequently hear people order. So let's uh, cover the Collins and the Gimlet Real and quick. then close it out. Again, another classic one you can always order um, is Collins, which is such a famous cocktail. It has a glass literally named after the cocktail to have it served in. Yep. Collins glass, uh, roughly eight to 12 ounces, depending on which bar you're in. I'm a big fan of the eight ounce glass. It's tall, it's thin, it's straight up and down. Um, Circumference should be roughly slightly larger. uh, If you were to make the okay sign, which we don't make anymore, because thank you fucking MAGA brothers. Um, The... It is a straight up and down glass. It does a great job of containing effervescence, but allowing the bubbles to flow through the beverage and expel oils. So that's the that's what a Collins is. Um, What's in the Collins? Collins. Uh, Xander, I am suddenly blanking. Uh, it is... A Collins is basically like a gin sour for, right. for the traditional. Um, oh, what's the ratio? That's what I was forgetting. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I mean, generally speaking, I would go with a you know one and a half ounces of gin, um, three quarters lemon juice, three quarters simple. Um, you shake it up, um, you dump it into your Collins glass, retop it with ice, because um, I would I always always strain out your fucking ice, people. Jesus Christ. Um, in my opinion, and then you top it off with some, with, with some soda water. So it has a nice bit of nice bit of bubble, a little bit of sweetness from the simple, uh, tartness from the uh, from the lemon, and of course it melds nicely with your. I would say that a dry gin is what you'd want to go with. A juniper forward gin is what you'd want to go with with the Collins. In all actuality, it tastes like what Seven Up is trying to be. Yeah, if Seven Up was good and also got you drunk, that'd be a Tom Collins. Sounds fantastic. It really is. Now, what about a Gimlet? Oh, you mean vodka Gimlet? One of my favorite drinks. Go for it. Just go for it. No, just fucking go for it. <laughs> no, um, okay. I will defer to you and you make a discuss a gin gimlet uh, because like I am so far out of the game that my ratios are all fucked up. There's a reason I only do house parties anymore. <laughs> all right. I mean, a vodka gimlet, what you do is... You get a gimmick glass, which is oftentimes a stemless vodka glass, and throw vodka, um, an olive, and scare it with just the slightest bit of uh, soda, and um, and usually a clear soda, like either Sprite or 7-Up, and that's a vodka gimlet. That's not what a gimlet actually is. No, a gimlet's going to be, it's going to be a very heavy uh, gin ratio. Mm -hmm. Um, the traditional recipe calls for like four parts gin, one part sweetened lime juice yep. or, or lime cordial. Right. Which is why they substitute Sprite or 7-Up. Because yeah. Because they're trying to get the um, substitute. So what I would probably do in that instance at most bars is just take a, you know, uh, like a half ounce of lime juice and a half ounce of um, uh, of simple. Um, combine those together. Now you have sweetened lime juice. That's one ounce of that compared to the four ounces of gin and then just pour that over the rocks a little lime wedge as a garnish call it a day very nice simple refreshing drink there's a theme here of 
Gin goes well with lime. It just does. It just does. A uh, tip for our budding bartenders out there, if you are working at a place that actually has actual sweetened lime juice, make sure the customer knows that because gin and vodka gimlets have become very popular in the last decade for diabetics um, because that that and vodka cranberries are things they can drink without fucking up their blood sugars. So if you have something that actually has sweetened lime juice, which has more sugar than 7-Up or Sprite, which usually is the case, make sure the customer knows that. That's a good call. And it also just makes you a good bartender to go and keep aware of, you know, these types of things. You know, always be aware of your customers' kind of uh, special needs, especially if they let you know that. And especially let them know that if they're gluten intolerant or celiac, they can drink literally everything and they are lying to you otherwise. That's one of my biggest pet peeves. <laughs> The distillation process brings out the gluten things that cause you problems. It is science. <laughs> God damn it. Um, unless there's something that is added post distillation, you can drink w- any kind of grain liquor and be fine. It all depends on whether IBS is co-occurring. But- um, and I got that information from celiac.com. Just so you know. Just so you know. Just so you know. And on that note, let's close it out. Oh, this was delicious. Thank you. So we all had different types. We had the four different types of gin in our gin and tonics right now. NPC, what did you think of yours? Eh. (laughs) (laughs) Barely scratched it. Gin's not my thing, but uh, it's okay. I I mean, I will be finishing this at some point, but eh, I would not order this at a bar. Okay. Uh, You were drinking the Union Gin. And Poppy, you were drinking the Citadel. Citadel. Um, I am enjoying this drink, but it is probably not something I'm going to order or drink all the time. Uh, If I want to sip a beverage, I'm probably going to get a whiskey drink. Sure. Or just, you know, to be fair. Again, we have two very different types of Um, uh, other cocktails coming up later. Yeah, but I, I am, I, I I like this, but it's not. I like the song. I'm probably not going to buy the album. <laughs> Put it that way. That was excellent. <laughs> Jacob, you were drinking the Ransom Gin and Tonic. Um, so, in all honesty, the Ransom as a gin and tonic is not a great build. Okay. Um, it's, it's, this is not where I see it shining. It's, it's okay. I, I, I wouldn't send it back if that was what they served me. Um, but it's, it does not highlight either the tonic nor the gin. Um, are they fighting? It's not that they're fighting. It's like they're quietly sitting in a room, not looking at each other with this layer of hops floating over the top. It's a very hoppy gin. It is a very hoppy It's gin. weird. <laughs> now I am a gin fan. I am a huge gin fan. Uh, I will drink gin straight. I will, uh, one of my favorite drinks, which I will bring up to redeem myself is a South African uh, martini. Oh, I thought you were going to go for the suffering bastard, but go on. No, no, uh, South African martini. Uh, it is a martini with um, a dry vermouth and a pepidou rather than um, anything else. What's a pepidou? A pepidou? A pepidou is a fruit. Uh, it, it's a relative of the pepper. It's... Um, Ooh, it's, it, I'm listening. No, no, it, it's not spicy at all, but it's... It, it's it's a distant relative of the pepper plant, but gotcha. um, a, a gin b- martini with that is awesome. And I will drink Hendrix all goddamn day. Yeah, I was going to buy it. It was either buy a bottle of something like Hendrix or buy two bottles of gin otherwise, because Hendrix is a little bit pricey. So let's get a review on yours. I went with the classic beef eater gin and tonic, and I loved it. I... You know, it had that kind of juniper punch, that like nice little bitterness from the quinine. Um, I like bitter drinks. Uh, I always have Campari at my house, <laughs> if that explains anything. Um, so I I enjoyed it. Um, I probably wouldn't drink it in the wintertime, but I think as a summertime sipper, it is hard to beat. And again, the high quality gin I, or, and the high quality of the... Uh, of the tonic water really make this as a standout, refreshing cocktail to go and sip on for a while. 
the other cocktails we'll make later are going to be very, very different. Okay, uh, that's a wrap for this episode. Closing this out, I do have a special note that uh, in case you were not aware, this is our 50th, 50th, that is a word, 50th numbered episode. Oh, awesome. What? What? Yep. The big five oh. Big five oh. The Happy bloody fifty. Anniversary, guys. Guys. <laughs> we're really doing it. What is we're really 50? doing That's it? The gold anniversary. Golden, Golden anniversary. yes. That's silver I, years, silver I think is twenty five. Silver yes. twenty five. Gold is fifty. What's pizza? I think. What's the pizza anniversary? Because I want that one. Fifty one. Okay. All right. Good to know. And on that note, we're going to be ordering pizza. <laughs> oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please. <laughs> anyway, uh, again, Biker Size and Bars recorded here in Portland, Oregon. Check us out online on our Discord, on our Patreon, if you want to kick us some monies. On our website, where we have a store that helps us out, kicks us a little bit back if you want to buy some merch. We have a store? Well, sort. It's a, oh, the it's Amazon a one. Store. Yeah, the yeah, Amazon yeah. Oh. store. Yeah, uh, get some more stuff on there. Yep. Hit us up on Facebook on the Twitters and all that stuff. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And we will talk to you. And we will talk to you. Yep. We might even have you on. Yep. Uh, but thanks for listening. As usual, I'm NPC. I'm just Jacob. I am Dr. Xander Jen Mander. <laughs> I am Poppy Beaujolais. And? I always keep a shiny side up. And when this shit opens up, tip your bartender like you've never seen them before and you want to do the dirty. No, sorry. Um, it's always tip your bartender. Make your dice always roll crits. Please always drink responsibly and wash your damn hands. Thanks for joining us, friend. We've reached the end of Biker's Dice and Bars. 